My name is Camilla. I'm 23 years old. I recently graduated from college. I live in a pretty nice house, but I have to share it with four other roommates. We're all friends from college, but after a couple months of living together, our relationship got strained. There was a lot of drama between us, especially when it came to sharing the bathroom. When we first moved in together, we all decided to go on a weekend trip to Las Vegas. We booked our hotels and got our plane tickets. And for a while, I was really excited to go. But then Cindy, one of my roommates, started getting on my case about all these stupid little things. She just yelled at me for no reason. I didn't wash the dishes clean enough. I put too much food in the cat bowl. It was like she wanted me to be miserable. So, a week before our Las Vegas trip, I told all my roommates that I wasn't going to go. I told them that they should all go and have a good time, but I would rather just stay back. My other roommates tried to get me to change my mind, but Cindy said that I was making the right decision. So that Friday, they left, and I had the house to myself. I thought I'd have a nice relaxing weekend by myself, and I did, at first. I cooked myself dinner, and I was watching old episodes of Grey's Anatomy. But then, something happened. It was a very loud, very angry knock on the front door. This happened around 10 o'clock at night, so I instantly thought that there was some crazy man outside. When I got to the door, I saw through the peephole that Cindy's boyfriend, Jackson, was standing outside. I'd only met him a couple times, but I did not like the guy. Back in school, he used to be in a fraternity, so you know the type. Loud, angry, thinks he's better than everyone. What do you want? I asked through the door. Cindy isn't here right now. I know that, he said. She's in Vegas, but I need to talk to you. Please, let me in. Why? I asked. Because you're beautiful, he said. And Cindy isn't here, so maybe we could just spend some time together? I couldn't believe it. He wanted to cheat on his girlfriend with me. There was no way that was going to happen. For one thing, I barely knew him. And for another, Cindy already hated me for no reason at all. I wasn't about to give her a reason to hate me. No, I told him. I'm sorry, but I'm not letting you in. Just for a second, he said. Trust me, you want to do this. I still hadn't opened the door, but that didn't stop Jackson. He pulled out his phone and held it up to the peephole. Just look, he said. It was hard to see through the keyhole, but I could make out that he was showing me a topless photo of someone. At first, I thought it was Cindy, but as I looked closer, I realized that he was showing me a picture of myself. What the hell? I asked. Let me in. I I'll explain. Was he blackmailing me? I was equally confused and disgusted by the picture but I needed to find out what he was up to. So, I opened the door, and he came in. I didn't say anything. I just crossed my arms and waited for him to explain. He said that he'd gotten a bunch of illicit photos of me from my awful ex, Trenton. I'd broken up with Trenton months ago, because that man was a real loser, but the worst part was, I'd never sent him any naked photos. He must have taken them without me noticing. I asked him why he was showing me this, and he said that he wanted us to get to know each other while his girlfriend was gone. But if I didn't do what he wanted, he'd send those photos to Cindy and everyone else I knew, and he'd tell them that we were having an affair. I was stunned. You're saying that if I don't sleep with you, then you'll tell everyone that I did. And if I do sleep with you, you won't. Pretty much, he said. He raised his phone to show me more blackmail photos he had of me, but I refused to look. I refused to play his game at all. I literally shoved him through the door and slammed it in his face. Then 
I locked and double locked the door and screamed for him to leave. This man seriously was one of the worst I'd ever met. Probably one of the most scary conversations I'd ever had in my life. I instantly called my sister to tell her what happened, but I had to end the conversation because my phone was blowing up. I guess Jackson had instantly done exactly what he said. He showed the naked photos to everyone. Cindy and my other roommates started texting me the most terrible things. They wanted me to move out of the house. They swore that they'd share my photos with my parents. I won't tell you the names they were calling me, but they were extremely bad. I tried to text them back an explanation of what happened, but of course, no one believed me. I assumed that all four of them were gathered in their Vegas hotel room and Cindy was riling them all up. She'd been looking for an excuse to turn everyone against me, and I believe that she did. I couldn't let this happen to me. I knew that no one was going to listen to me explain, so I had to do something to prove my innocence. Thankfully, I knew where Jackson lived, so I got in my car and drove there immediately. I went to his dump of an apartment and pounded on the door until he answered. He just smiled and said, so, you've changed your mind? I said, yes, everyone thinks I'm a cheater, so I've got nothing to lose. I'll sleep with you, but not until you tell me why you pulled this ridiculous stunt. He was evasive at first, but I made sure that he said exactly what he'd done. He had no idea that I was recording his confession the whole time. He admitted to the blackmail and the stolen photos, but then he said something I couldn't believe. He said that Cindy knew about what he was doing. She was the one who gave him the photos, not my ex-boyfriend. This was all part of her plan to turn herself into a martyr and to alienate me from the rest of the roommates. I asked him why he agreed to go along with it, and he just shrugged and said, Why not? You're really hot. Thank you, I said. That's all I needed to hear. And then I left. He tried to stop me, of course, but I pushed him away and raced out of there. When I got back to my house, I listened to the recording to make sure I could hear everything, and then I sent it to Cindy and my other roommates. It didn't stop there, though. I sent it to Sydney's parents and her boss, and literally every contact I had in my phone. After that, my other three roommates came back home early. They left Cindy in Las Vegas, and I never saw her again. She still hasn't even come back to pick up her stuff. I know this sounds ridiculous. I mean, how could someone think of such a complicated revenge plan for no reason at all? I kind of want to find Cindy and ask her what she was thinking, but it's probably for the best that I leave her alone. I knew what was coming. Everyone in the car knew what was coming. And I had a sense that Andy, my 16-year-old younger brother, also knew because he did not throw a tantrum the entire trip back from church. And Andy always threw a tantrum on our way back from church. Nothing troubled the stiff tranquility in the car, but for the occasional sign that my father let out at unrhymed intervals. I was in trouble because I had kissed a boy in church. The car squealed when my father turned it into the street, and I felt my heart thump so furiously against my rib cage that I feared that if it beat any faster, there would be a gaping hole there in the stead. My mouth ran dry and parched, quicker by the second as the car glided down the street to our own house. With the left swerve of his hand, Dad sharply cut the bend and we were in the walkway. <sighs> Worthless child, better dead than bringing us shame. Mother said in a desperate breath, the soul that sins must die, my father said and my blood ran cold. I felt turbulence brew in me so powerful that it made me shed a tear. I understood his words were no joke. He had done it before. He was revered in the neighborhood, 
and had such powerful connections that had proven useful the last time. The last time it was my older brother. He was 19 just like me when it happened, but it still felt like a lifetime ago in my eyes. I recollected the details in broken pieces. He had been with a girl in church and they had been caught in a compromising position. Father, mother, Andy and I, and Tom had been in the car all the way home. Then, father had said something of the sort. I went to my room on that occasion and it was barely hours later that I heard Tom start to cry. He begged terribly in his crying. He begged for respite from father's holy anger and mother's righteous indifference. With each cry, I could sense his strength wane. I sniffed. Come with me, Andy, my mother said, and pushed her side of the door open. Andy's side of the car clicked open, and mother moved over to seize him. I stared downwards at the car latch on my side of the car, and it was still shut. I blanched in horror. You must say your repentance. Your blood atones for the sins of your flesh, my father said, a stable tone that only betrayed anger. I suspected that he had said the same words to Tom before he handed him a sacrificial knife, the same knife which the people of the church he pastors over cut themselves with when they have been caught in sin or confession to sin until he decrees their trespass forgiven by heaven. I had no desire to bleed. Tom had bled. He had slashed his flesh with the blade until he was leaking, but father did not find forgiveness until Tom was gasping for breath. I sniffed back at the thought of such a strange consequence. No, I cried, and jumped out through the seat where Andy had sat. I ran after mother into the house because it was the only sanctuary I could think of. I did not want to bear such an ugly ritual because I'd kissed a boy. I had heard girls my age kissing boys, and they did not have such violent marks of violent encounters to show for it. Mother appeared aghast when she saw me come from behind her, nudging her to the side as I rushed to my room. Father was on his heels behind me, carrying the knife. I wasn't thinking. I was simply living in horror which I wanted to escape from. I found my phone on my bed and I rushed to my room and picked it up. My father's yelling was loud from the door when I clicked on the emergency numbers. Mother soon joined in the frenzy, as passionate as he was, that I must bleed if I should atone for my sins. I fumbled terribly from panic that I dialed the wrong numbers twice before I finally got it right. 911. My head struggled to interpret the commotion that my parents' footsteps were coming to my door with Andy beside them. I was not ready to hurt myself, not like Tom, who they had broken in their lust for righteousness. I remembered how father had dispatched the semi-conscious Tom in a van, which was owned by one of his close friends. It was the last time I had seen Tom. He had simply laid a missing person report at the office, and the officers had been misdirected. When the soothing voice of a respondent came from over the phone, I was drawn into a brief silence that required calling to draw out of me. I started to speak into the phone. I told them my address in a quick, shallow breath and heard from the respondent that police officers were on their way. I threw the phone on the bed and started to think of an escape route from my family. Open the door, child. Accept your fate as it is. My father said, slinking the knife down the edge of the door to draw me out. The noise of the steel blade against the wood made my stomach sink. Wretched child, a shame to virtue. Open up and feel the pain of your sins, my mother said. Father's patience ran thin. He lifted the knife and stabbed it through the door. The wood creaked. I was breathless with fear. I will have to do it myself, since you are too cowardly, my father said, slipping into a frenzy. My skin was numb. I was so afraid that I started to go blind when my vision blurred out from the sheer force of blood pumping into my head. My lips quivered and my limbs trembled. 
I watched from inside the room as father broke down the door. Mother had words, and she praised his strength, riling his devoted rally for the Lord. He saw me, I saw him, but he looked nothing like my father. His eyes were heavy and red. He appeared manic. Mother also had become the crazed version of herself, all of the exertion on the door. Father gripped the hilt of the knife tighter. I heard the shrill cries of sirens in the distance, and I took it as cue for my escape. I turned to my room's window and jumped through the gap in a daze. I ran as quickly as my feet could carry me when I saw the cops and ran to them with father and mother behind me. Put your hands up, the cops said to me, and then to mother and father when they stopped in our driveway. Sarah, the cops called. I answered that it was me. They then turned to my parents. The knife fell out of my father's hand. You're both under arrest for attempted murder, the cops said to my parents. The warm summer Montana breeze rushed through the car once we rolled the windows down, and our music escaped the tiny box. Derek, Gina, and I were on our way to a little lake in the middle of the woods, where Derek's grandparents had built a little cabin that we intended to use for the weekend. I'd never been to such a beautiful place, and the vibrant blue sky revealed exactly why they called it Big Sky Country. After driving for hours, we were almost there. As we passed the last gas station, and the last point of civilization for miles, I noticed a grisly man staring at our car as it drove by. Overalls covered with oil and soot, the man was filling up his old green truck, stacked full of tools, wood, and miscellaneous junk. We turned on the dirt road that led us to the cabin. It was a little dusty inside, but it had seen some use earlier that summer by Derek's cousins. It didn't take us long until we ran out to the dock and jumped into the crystal clear lake. We swam for a little bit before eating lunch in the sunshine. It was a great start to the vacation, as I'd never been to such a beautiful place. I think that I'm going to lay down for a while, I said, as the sun and swimming was draining all the energy from me. The spare bedroom has plenty of blankets, but shake everything out, Derek said. It's been some time since anyone's used any of it. I climbed the little hill up to the cabin and found the spare room filled with blankets and pillows that all held that dusty cabin smell among them. After patting off a layer of rested sediment and swatting away a spider or two, I nestled onto the single bed and quickly succumbed to my exhaustion. When I awoke, a sticky sweat clung to every inch of my skin, and my head throbbed for water. Where I thought my energy would be replenished, it was only diminished more so. The golden hue of the early twilight hour streamed through the thin white curtains over the windows. The cabin was quiet, even after I opened the guest bedroom door and entered the living space. None of the lights were on in the cabin, and there were no signs of Derek or Gina, besides the bags they'd dropped by their doors earlier. I assumed they were still out by the lake or swimming, so I made my way down to the dock, only to find it void of my friends. Hey guys, I called out as an uneasy bubble began percolating from gut to throat. Only the cheerful chips of the crickets responded. As I walked up the hill to the cabin, a loud snap came from the woods nearby. I froze in my tracks and waited for the source of the noise. I assumed it was a deer, but the back of my head told me that it had to have been something rather big to make such a noise. I hustled back to the cabin. Guys, I asked as I entered and closed the door behind me. When there was no response, I locked the deadbolt. I started to think that my friends were playing a prank on me when I found the note on the kitchen countertop. It was written by Gina and explained that they'd gone to the store to get some liquor. I set the note down and checked out the window in the direction of the snapping sound I'd heard. It was near impossible to see anything between the twisting shadows of the hulking trees. 
In the thick of the trees, it already appeared to be night, even though the sky still carried a heavenly glow. I took up one of the magazines that I brought along and sat on one of the couches, where I planned to wait until my friends returned. A small squeal escaped my lips, and I dropped the magazine as a horrid, raking noise came from the side of the cabin. Although I was hesitant, I peeked out the window. It was even darker now. I did not find anything. As I searched the room for a light switch that would turn on a patio light, another scratch came from a different portion of the house. I found the switch for an outside light in the kitchen, where I conveniently grabbed one of the cooking knives. A slight tapping on one of the glasses turned into a loud crackling as the glass shattered. Suddenly, I thought about the man we'd seen when we drove past the convenience store. Had he followed us? What sort of things would he be capable of doing? I tried to think of what else it could be, but all I could imagine was that man breaking into the cabin and taking me with him. My mind raced and panicked as I rounded the corner with the knife point held high. Nothing but a few wisps of the fading dusk light streamed in the broken window. I checked over my shoulder, getting the sudden feeling that someone was standing with me in the room. I knew that if I stayed inside the box that he would get me. The urge to flee filled my body as my flight mechanisms kicked in. Knife still in hand, I counted to three and took a deep breath before breaking from the front door. No one stood on the patio, so I sprinted down the roadway, praying that the intruder wasn't armed with a firearm. My soul utterly sank when a roar filled the air. The fantastical nightmares of a human invader suddenly melted away as I began cursing myself for leaving the house. A glance over my shoulder and I could see the outline of the beast. A grizzly that stood nearly as tall as the cabin roof. My gut told me to run back to the house, but my head said there was no chance that I would make it. The bear didn't take long to follow me, so I darted into the thick of the trees. An ear-shattering snarl caused my spine to quiver. My whole body tremored, and I stopped running after the first bang. And after the second, I could hear the bear taking off in a different direction. Lily! Gina's voice called out. Lily! Derek's voice also filled the air. I came out of the trees to see Derek and Gina walking with the man who I assumed was the cause of the intrusion. I ran to them and embraced my friends in a hug. I looked at the man, who still wore his greasy overalls, and held a shotgun that was pointed at the ground. He was watching in the direction where the bear ran off. You all right? He asked as he finally looked at me. I expected harsh, piercing eyes, but they were kind and gentle. The bears around here always like easy food that people leave behind. Thank you. I said. We stayed long enough to board up the window, then began driving home. My name is Adrian, and I'm 41 years old. I work as a restaurant chef. After several years of experience, I became one of the best. Food is my passion, and I love to cook. Becoming a top chef improved my paycheck, but at the same time, it also increased my responsibilities. I have several people working under my direction, and nothing less than perfection is expected when our meals are served. It's a very exciting and rewarding job, but also very demanding. Perhaps one of the reasons why I never married or started a family. So every time I have a few days off, I like to get the best out of them. Mostly, I need to relax and to rest. But not in a boring way, like staying home, watching TV while sitting on the couch. I like to release my stress, mostly around nature. I enjoy the feeling of being surrounded by trees, the ocean, or mountains. It's the perfect way for both body and mind to replenish energies. That's why I decided to buy a cottage and a small property surrounded by a vast forest a couple of years ago. The perfect place for me to read and to take long walks. The cottage also has a fireplace, which meant I can also go there during the cold season. And this is precisely what I did last winter. I was going to work on Christmas Eve, 
something that happened often in my area. Once again, I wouldn't be visiting my parents and sister during such a special holiday. But at least I could forget about that emotional period by spending three days in my delightful cottage during the week before Christmas. But not alone, by all means. My dog, Brownie, would be my faithful companion. A few days later, it was snowing, and everything looked magnificent up there in the woods when I arrived. Taking my car, of course. The snow wasn't too much, though. Just enough to cover the trees and the grass in a big white blanket. Once inside the cottage, I put some wood in the fireplace, which quickly made the place warm and cozy, and I prepared a simple meal for myself and Brownie. I was having the most pleasant evening. I read a novel, listened to the music, and enjoyed a glass of really good red wine. While I sat comfortably and safely inside my cottage, a chilly wind blew outside. Brownie was asleep next to me. I always loved these small contrasts, which make things seem more enjoyable. It was already 2 a.m. when I decided to call it a day. Besides the main room, the cottage also had two small bedrooms. Me and Brownie were sleeping in the bigger one. Didn't take long for me to fall asleep once I switched off the lights. Unfortunately, it didn't take long for me to wake up either. I heard someone knocking on the cottage's front door. At first, I thought it was an animal, because who could be up there in the middle of a snowy and cold, pitch-black night? But I was now listening to a human voice, coming from the other side of the door. I have to admit, initially, I just stood still in my warm and comfortable bed, praying that whoever was there would simply go away. I was probably being selfish, but I was also a bit scared. What if that person wanted to rob me? Or worse, harm me? Being in the middle of the woods does bring out some survival instinct, and my situation was vulnerable. In any case, the human-produced noises coming from outside didn't end. In fact, besides the door, I could listen to knockings and beatings surrounding the entire cottage. The walls were also being harassed, which means there were several individuals outside. I could hear their voices. They sounded like female voices. Like they were crying for help in despair. I was terrified, and I wanted to call for help myself. Brownie started barking inside my bedroom, which only made my unwelcomed visitors more excited. A couple of them were now barking too, as in response to my dog. Very creepy. A part of me was hoping that it was just a prank. Some youngsters who went to the forest to smoke some weed and, when seeing the cottage and my car outside, decided to have some fun at my expense. After one long hour, the noises finally stopped. Even Brownie was silent and calm again. This was a good sign, since dogs are great sensors of danger or intruders. And it's not just because of their excellent sense of smell. I think they have this sixth sense or something like that. I was finally able to go back to sleep. When I woke up, it was already 3 p.m., but it was fine. I was on vacation. Oh, so much for relaxing, I said to myself while preparing my coffee, still feeling uneasy due to the events from the previous night. I looked outside through the window, and there they were, the footprints on the snow from several individuals. But I also saw that my car's windows were broken, and this made me angry. What the f- Come on! I shouted as I went outside to see what other damage had been made. Followed by Brownie, I approached the car. And as I did, I screamed when I saw someone's head popping up. Someone was inside my car. A thin and frail-looking woman, very dirty, was smiling at me. As if she'd been waiting for me to come up. Some of her teeth were missing. Hey, what are you doing here? Can I help you? I asked. The woman's eyes were creepy, and she started to laugh. An insane laughter. I was about to have the response to one of my questions. Coming from the woods, more creepy women were now showing up. There were three of them. They all were very dirty with long hair. All of them were horrific just like their old clothes, already in pretty bad shape. 
The whole group of four was now running towards me, screaming like chimpanzees. Like hostile chimpanzees. I ran like a maniac back to the cottage, knowing that I was running for my life. I was able to get inside, and I locked the door behind me. But Brownie, brave as he was, didn't follow me. Instead, he kept barking at them, trying to protect me. In spite of being able to bite and to scare them away for a few minutes, Brownie proved to be no match for those apparently frail-looking, dirty women. I was shocked to see that they had knives with them. In tears, I stood there helpless. I saw Brownie being killed by that haunting group. I wanted to call 911, but I had no idea how to tell them where I was, what kind of directions I could give them, especially being so nervous. Fortunately, killing Brownie seemed to satisfy that group's thirst for blood, but they returned to where they came from, deep into the woods. At least for the moment. But I wasn't going to wait any longer. Regardless of the broken windows, everything else was fine with my car. I drove back to the city as fast as I could. I reported what happened to the police and took them to my cottage. The body of my dog was gone, but the bloodstains could still be seen painting the snow in red. As for those dangerous and primitive women, they're still to be found by the authorities. I miss Brownie. Sometimes I think that I act like a mouse. Had I shown more courage? But they had knives with them, and it was four of them, so what could I really do? Brownie sacrificed himself for me. I mean, that's what pets are for, right? <laughs>